Hey, Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We're in downtown San Francisco at the Hilton at the Financial uh, Center, at, and we're at the Chief Data Scientist USA Conference, a relatively small conference, but a lot of uh, heavy lifting Chief Data Scientists talking about not only the data science itself, but really kind of the role of the, of the person, which turns out to be, need a lot more soft skills than necessarily all data science skills. We're excited to be joined by Haile Owusu, the Chief Data Scientist at Mashable. Welcome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. So uh, the conference has been going on for a couple days. Yeah. Any surprises uh, that, that have come out that, that you've seen? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mean, one very specific surprise was uh, one of the, uh, the conference speakers mentioned and uh, they, they have a very large team of data scientists and their philosophy, which I found really intriguing, was essentially an expectation that their data scientists would mature to the point where they would control uh, entire project pipelines from data collection to the establishment of, of uh, the API associated with the project. And so that kind of full stack data science expectation from the totality of their team is actually was a bit of a revelation for me, personally. Yeah. Now the, the panel that you just led was really about how the chief data scientists communicate to the business. Yeah. Um, how they engage with them, how they communicate what they want to do, and, and really what, what struck me is that it's very much a sales role as in any leadership role yeah. as to selling what you're doing, the value of what you're doing, and then specifically building trust around unwrapping the black box a little bit so it just doesn't go in and come out and here's the yeah. answer to the question, but yeah. you really got to sell it. You really do have to sell it. I mean, it's, it's one, one, uh, one speaker queried the audience and asked whether uh, we as audience members thought that the chief data scientist role was primarily the role of a scientist engaging the business as opposed to a business executive uh, coordinating the explanation of science and extracting value from it. And uh, <clears throat> it, one of the things that certainly crept up on me in the role is really the, the vital importance of the, uh, the, the sort of business soft skills component of it. Right. It's, it's, it is, uh, it's not something that is n natural and native to most uh, most scientists, but it really is where the value from um, machine learning algorithms really gets extracted because there's this communication gap that has to be bridged, right? Uh, which happens at the level of communication, not at the level of technology. Right, right. Yeah. And then, and then things like mm -hmm. you know, simple things like data quality. You know, do you have the right data to answer yeah. the question? Is the question formulated in the right way that you can actually go solve it? So there's yeah. a lot of, it's almost like a big uh, system integration project uh, expectation management in doing that engagement, building the trust, and yet still trying to deliver some value. Yeah, this is particularly key because um, I think the most interesting data science work happens at the interface between uh, you know, practitioners and people who are not especially quantitative, who are expecting, and rightfully so, expecting to extract real, concrete, revenue-based value, um, but are completely uh, in the dark about uh, 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 about the details, right. essentially, and so um, again, being able to communicate that is uh, of extremely high value. And the other the other thing that comes up all the time, we do a lot of shows, is you know there just aren't enough data scientists, just just period. Um, and we go back to kind of the buggy whip, you know, there weren't enough buggy whip manufacturers um, f for cars and or chauffeurs, right, yeah. when they first came out with cars. So we really need to change the discussion. The chief data scientist has to help the business users and kind of drive down the tools, the engagement, the interaction to people beyond just the chief data scientist to really get the increased buy And I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, one of the gentlemen talked about making this whole process much more interactive to get a feedback loop, a trust with the business owner. So it's really not this kind of one way you know, here's what I'm telling you. It's really oh, more no. of this kind of engagement. Yeah, and in fact, if you try, if you try to prosecute uh, uh, the results of a data science uh, group that way as a kind of uh, a dictate, uh, you will get immediate pushback, and people will dis disengage. And I mean, a, 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 in, for a company to invest in data science is a high upfront commitment. And so, if one goes that approach, you'll 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 find that key stakeholders will divest from, from, a, from a data science team, right. I think. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it, is, it is far less a dictation and much more of, it's kind of an ambassadorship, actually. I mean, you are sitting on uh, techniques and approaches that are probably relatively new to the industry in which uh, you're housed, and you have to sell them on investing both time 
and money and effort in unearthing this uh, this this functionality and embedding it in the in the company. Now you you have a day job. You don't just get, uh, run conferences all the time. I, I don't. <laughs> so no. you you you're in charge of the Velocity Technology at Mashable. That's right. Yeah. Which is uh, the viral life cycle of digital media. Yeah. Um, really interesting. Everybody wants their content to go digital, right? Uh, or go viral, excuse me. They do, yeah. So, just curious um, on that project, what are some of the things that, that, that you've discovered? What are some of the surprises that most people wouldn't think about? How do you continue to tweak your models as social media continues to evolve and adapt? And you know, yeah. it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's Snapchat, God knows what the kids are going to be on next week. Yeah, no, I mean, so I, I'll just say that, you know, we've, we've uh, invested a lot of time and effort in really trying to understand uh, and predict how how much engagement uh, uh, an article or a video is likely to get after it's been published. Uh, we consider all sorts of signals and uh, we, we've gotten our accuracy uh, really quite high based on really early, early behavior of a piece of content. I think one of the things that uh, is underappreciated is how hard it is to predict how well a piece of content is going to do before you publish it. Um, there is a huge gap in explanation between how well something is going to do after it's been published and you actually get a few uh, uh, indication of, of, of how well it's doing initially to having no information whatsoever except information about what the content is, whether it has an image, whether it's talking about this topic or that topic. That's the, explaining the, the, the latter scenario, very difficult. And uh, we've made some strides along those lines, but it turns out to be probably a fairly fundamentally difficult problem. And, and, and are there just some triggers that you see as a kind of a typical behavior for things that really fly, that kind of hit that magic around? I just go back to you know the, the, the woman with the, with the Star Wars mask in the car, right? That, that, and she tells the story, you know, she, she puts on her Wookiee mask and laughs at I herself. I have no idea what you're talking you about. You haven't, <laughs> thought, you haven't seen this thing. But it went, it went crazy viral literally yeah. o overnight. I mean, yeah. she went to bed and she woke up the next day and she was an internet star. And, you know, it's not a, a, a published piece of news, yeah, but, sure. but still, just, you know, she hit that magic. Um, and, and, and everyone wants it. And the other, of course, factor is everybody, it's the overnight sensation, but you didn't know they've been working for years, for and, years, years yeah, and years yeah. and years and yeah. years. Um, but knowing what you know, do people, do you try to bake that in? Is it, is it, is it baked in with, with tags? Do you, you know, basically let the, the author you know, write it as they would in their voice and then come back and make adjustments? I mean, how do you kind of bring your, your skill set, your data, your knowledge of what's gone before and help make sure that that great piece of content that's, that's being published tomorrow gets the proper, if that's the right word, amount of uh, uptake. Yeah, just to be clear, the work that we do with Velocity, uh, again, this idea of uh, dictatorship versus ambassadorship, we really avoid uh, attempting to, to impose a kind of data dictatorship on the content creation process. So for us at Mashable, we take all our accumulated uh, information in the Velocity Suite and we, we embed it in our, our CMS and essentially allow writers to see a running history of, 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 of viral hits, not only our own, but sort of across the publishing landscape. And what we found is that um, writers are able to, to distill from, from a sort of a collection of greatest hits uh, filtered by topic, filtered by time window, filtered by uh, language keywords. They're, they're able to, to incorporate that collected history into their writing. And we, we, we found that in general that tends to, to, to yield better outcomes, both in terms of uh, overall engagements, uh, overall viewership, but also I think we, we find uh, in, in terms of just like the depth and quality of, uh, of the, the content. Because you can also, it also allows you to see sort of where co similar content has fallen short. Right. So right. we don't do, we don't make uh, sort of dictatorial recommendations as to what uh, folks will write about. That's not our, our, our way. Rather, we use the technology to be able to, to distill out what has worked in a sort of a historical compendium, present it to writers, and then they can take, use that, use their judgment as to how to use that for their writing. Right, right. And, and so we come back a year from now, um, as you look forward, as this landscape continues to evolve, what are you tracking? What are you keeping an eye on? What are you excited about that's kind of changing? Yeah. changing in this world? I mean, without question, uh, uh, it's, it, it's a popular buzzword, but it, it, uh, 
it's, it's, it's actually sort of revolutionizing how we're, we're thinking about content, and that's namely uh, in improvements in uh, uh, the, the state of the deep learning art. So uh, the use of long short-term uh, neural networks, um, uh, convolutional neural net networks, they've allowed us to do feature extraction on, on images and text in a way that we hadn't been able to before. And uh, there has been a significant improvement in our ability to do predictions uh, along these lines. So right. um, I, the pace there is very fast. I have no, basically it's, very, it's impossible to say what that's going to look like even a year from now, but there's no question it'll, it'll be an impressive um, uh, uh, advance forward for us uh, uh, in the future. Very exciting. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking a few minutes. No, thank you. Absolutely. Pleasure. Yeah. Ahaili Usu, the chief data scientist for Mashable. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE.